Thank you. Uh, good morning and a warm welcome to the 25th meeting of the Constitution Europe External Affairs and Culture Committee in 2022. Our first agenda item is a decision on taking business in private. Our members can take to take agenda item three in private. Yes. Right. Thank you. Agenda item two is our um, evidence session on Legislative Consent Memorandum on the Retained EU Law Revocation and Reform Bill. And we are delighted to be joined this morning by Dr Kirsty Hood KC, Faculty of Advocates, Dr Emily Hancock, Lecturer in Law from the University of Bristol, and Charles Livingston, Partner at Prodi's LLP Solicitors. Um, we are also being joined online by uh, Michael Clancy, OBE, Director of Law Reform, Law Society of Scotland, and Professor Alison Young, Professor of Public Law at the University of Cambridge. And a warm welcome to you all. And um, as always in the hybrid situation, I'll, I'll try to manage this. It's, it's never as easy as when everyone's in the room, but we'll try our best to ensure that everybody gets a chance to come in. So um, I wonder if I could open with a question around a recent report into the impact of Brexit and devolution, where the committee set out a view that the extent of UK ministers' new delegated powers in devolved areas amounts to a significant constitutional change. The retained EU law bill is another bill in the post-Brexit era which confers significant powers onto ministers, including on UK ministers potentially in devolved areas. So I wondered if the panels had reflections on this and whether they thought that the bill was proportionate in its approach. And I wonder if I could maybe start with um, Dr Hancock first. Um, OK, well, thank you very much for inviting me here today. Um, so in terms of the, the changes, I suppose, to devolved competence and to the level of significant constitutional change brought about by the proposed um, bill. It, it appears to me that um, the bill, um, well, while in some ways it doesn't make significant changes to, I suppose, devolved competences, it does, however, introduce the possibility, um, or it does, I suppose, change in some ways the division of powers in the sense that it grants um, the UK government, ministers of the Crown, um, powers over, I suppose, um, considerable retained EU law, which will include, of course, um, many statutory instruments, including Scottish statutory instruments, without any proposal for a consent mechanism in place. It also changes um, the protection um, in terms of a kind of a wider constitutional issue. It also changes the protection of fundamental rights in the UK in the sense that um, the general principles of EU law will no longer be part of retained EU law. And this introduces a further divergence in terms of fundamental rights protection across the UK in the sense that, well, of course, Northern Ireland still remains bound by the Charter, although there are powers potentially to restate. So I, I think I'll um, leave my remarks there. Sorry, I'm getting a message from the clerk there. Um, can, I, can I possibly bring in um, Dr Hood next? Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I would, I would agree with what Dr Hancock said. I, I think that the, the issue is, perhaps the, the key parts of the issue really are twofold. And the first one is one which actually I think that Chris McCorkindale advising this committee had already identified, which is the extent to which in practice the reality of this is it allows UK ministers to move into the devolved space. And the realities of the mechanism involved are that it does so in a way where consent uh, from from this parliament will not necessarily be required so i think that really is in practice these are the, the two key areas in which i can understand why the committee would want to consider this area about whether it does involve an incursion into the devolved competences okay. mr livingston um 
Yeah, so from from my perspective, I think the striking thing about the the powers conferred on ministers of the Crown here is that they are, uh, at least in part, powers to um, preserve, restate legislation that is within devolved competence. And I find it I find it surprising that there would thought to be any need for the the UK government to perform that role. Um, you know, to put it simply, why why should the why if the Scottish government doesn't care enough to use its own powers um, to to restate or um, to save legislation that's in an involved area, then why would the UK government want to step in? Um, and I think the the inclusion of um, powers for the UK government in those areas, I think it's indicative of a little bit of a habit having been formed by the earlier Brexit legislation. Um, where I think in relation to things like the EU Withdrawal Act, one one could at least uh, see the argument that there were certain things that mechanically would need to happen in order to give effect to Brexit, and that UK ministers might want power to ensure that those things happened, even if the devolved authorities were not were not keen to exercise their own powers. I don't see I don't see any equivalent uh, need in this bill. I don't see any mechanical. Uh, necessity for the UK government to be able to to step in um, to do something within devolved areas if the Scottish government or the other devolved authorities uh, have declined to do so. Um, so, so to some extent, I think um, the the Brexit uh, legislation, the stuff to give effect to Brexit as a mechanical issue rather than whatever one's philosophical conception of Brexit, if this is completing Brexit or otherwise, we're no longer in, in mechanical uh, territory where there are certain things that, that are unavoidable and somebody has to do. Um, I think here, uh, if you take the sunset um, provision as your starting point, I don't see what the objection would be to saying that if, if the uh, legislation in question um, is within devolved competence that only the Scottish government should have the power um, to decide whether that stays, whether it's restated, whether it's modified. Um, so that's that's my concern that the the sort of core Brexit legislation you might say was was sui generis. It was it was in a category of its own, and so ex, you know extraordinary times and all that. Um, but it now seems to be becoming a little bit of a habit uh, and and being repeated in in areas where. Um, you can't really make that same case. Okay. Unfortunately, we have technical gremlins, and I believe that our witnesses online can't hear our discussion. Um, hopefully, we'll be able to bring them in very so shortly. I apologise apologise to them for, for that situation. So I'm going to move to questions from the committee, and I'll go first to Mr Cameron. Uh, thank you, convener. Can I uh, refer to my register of interest as a member of the Faculty of Advocates? Um, I... Uh, just picking up on that last point from, from Mr Livingston, um, obviously there's um, the, the ability of the Scottish Government to, quote, keep pace uh, with uh, EU law. And it's a state of policy of the Scottish Government to align with um, EU law. And therefore there is an ability um, for the Scottish Government to, to do so in, in the 2021 Continuity Act. Um, and I just, I'm interested in that relationship between the, the Scottish Government's um, ability already to align and its, um, the, the, the potential under this bill for uh, the Scottish Government and others to restate um, retained EU law. And I just wonder if you've got any further observations on that. Uh, is that for me specifically? Yeah, for, 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 for all the... Witnesses, shall I go first? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, I, I think if if the bill goes if the bill goes through in terms of the Scottish government's powers, um, the Scottish government's powers to re to restate and probably more importantly to to just save the legislation from repeal to begin with, um, would certainly mean that that the Scottish government uh, would have the ability to stop. Um, any retained EU law that is within devolved competence from being sunsetted. Um, that then creates issues of legal certainty, which, which we may come on to, depending on the mechanics of how that worked. Um, but whether you look at the powers within this bill or the powers in the Continuity Act, which obviously is a very broad secondary legislation power, 
Um, I think between the two of those, um, the Scottish Government would have um, very wide powers to, to preserve, if that's the right word, retained EU law. Um, and, and I think that that connects to my previous point, which is that given that the Scottish Government has all those powers, um, you know, there isn't necessarily, or, or I, I don't necessarily see a case having been made for the UK Government to have the powers to do the same things. Um, Dr Hood. Thank you very much. Thank you. I think I would probably, all I would add to that are two possible issues in terms of keeping pace. And one is an issue which was flagged, I think, in the written uh, briefing from the faculty, which is the fact that within this bill, um, there is talk about not increasing the regulatory burden um, and the inability for certain if something is being replaced or alternative provision being made, the inability to increase the regulatory burden. So you'd have to consider how that might interact with a, a desire to keep pace. Um, and the other thing is something out with the four corners of this, but obviously is the Internal Market Act and whether the Internal Market Act would um, put a, a break on, on keeping pace just in terms of some of the mechanisms there. But that, that's not something within the four corners of this bill. Thank you. Uh, and Dr Hancock, if you want to add to that. Um, I, don't, I don't have um, much to add. I suppose it does just mean that there is, um, at this point, potentially a proliferation of, I suppose, secondary legislative powers of, of differing scope and with potentially differing um, potential for scrutiny. And so I suppose the procedure which is adopted and the method which is used will be something that the Scottish Parliament will want to consider. Thank you for those answers. Um, could I move on to uh, another point, which is to ask the uh, panel uh, what, uh, about what, what, the, what, what, the, what is the alternative here? Is the alternative here to simply leave retained EU law on the statute book in force and for slowly over time, UK government, Scottish government, Welsh government to to pick off what they want to uh, remove uh, and leave what they want to, to, to remain. I, is, that, is that realistically the alternative? I'll start with Dr Hood. Thank you very much. Yes, I, I think that is. I think that's well put. And that allows, because already, already that really was the, the position, was the idea was that at the, as at the end of the transition period, that certain legislation would immediately be removed um, from the various legal systems, which plainly could not work out with, the, out with us being an EU member, the, the UK being an EU member. So that some of that, as I say, has already been identified and removed. And likewise, some perhaps not particularly significant amendment, but a degree of amendment and modification was required to make certain things work within a, a different scope. So, so that has taken place. And what that therefore left was exactly what you described, the ability to have a sector by sector or area by area, topic by topic review of what was there. And either, either because of a sectoral review or even just because something came to, came to be a priority or came to be an issue of focus for either this parliament or the parliament in Westminster, um, then it could at that stage be changed or altered, uh, as the case may be. But absolutely, I think that is. And it just allows um, things to be changed when it appears appropriate or by way of uh, a sectoral review of, of various areas. But I agree, I think that is the alternative. Um, can I just check in? Can our witnesses online hear us? Okay. Well, I, I believe they are back online. Uh, uh, and if they could bring in, if they want to address the first question as well, they could, when you... Uh, absolutely. I don't know if Mr Clancy wants to start um, with either that, that point or, or my first question, which was around the sort of tension between uh, keeping pace and, and the, the bill. Thank you very much indeed, uh, uh, Mr Cameron, for that interesting question. Um, uh, of course, uh, I, I, I could draw your attention to the comments of Tobias Locke, uh, which are in the... Uh, paper before the committee today, uh, and uh, I would not depart from uh, anything that uh, Dr Locke would say here um, in terms of the way in which uh, the Continuity Act powers uh, run in parallel, 
uh, with uh, the provisions of the, the rural bill um, uh, and that the Scottish Government could, uh, in uh, years to come, um, uh, enact uh, legislation which would keep pace with EU law, um, uh, even though it may have been sunsetted uh, or uh, otherwise dealt with under uh, the, the current bill. So I, I think that probably would cover off uh, my comment on that point. Uh, uh, and um, if I can just locate the question which you asked in the screen. Um, <clears throat> um, now, no, I don't, I don't have your second question on the screen. Could you repeat it, please, Mr Cameron? Yeah, my second question was about the alternative, you know, is the alternative to this, in just speaking in very general terms, is the alternative to this just to leave retained EU law on the statute book and in time for any government to pick off what it chooses to remove and just leave in place that which it, you know, it would prefer to remain? Is that, is that the sort of obvious alternative? It, it is the obvious alternative, um, and in fact, it fits with the plan. Um, insofar as there was a plan, um, a, a, as we saw in the, the white paper, uh, which uh, the then Prime Minister Theresa May um, explained what the plan was um, uh, to convert the ACI uh, into UK law uh, at the moment uh, and repeal the. European Communities Act 1972, uh, and then uh, proceed uh, to uh, have the same rules, and I'll quote here uh, from the passage in uh, legislating for the UK's withdrawal from the European Union command paper, the same rules and laws will apply on the day after exit as on the day before. It will then be for democratically elected representatives in the UK, and I think that that's meant to comprise the UK Parliament, Scottish Parliament, uh, the then Welsh Assembly, now the Senate, uh, and uh, the Northern Ireland Assembly, uh, to decide on any changes to that law after full scrutiny and proper debate. And I think that that's, uh, uh, if uh, one would um, uh, allow me the opportunity to, to uh, say that uh, uh, the then Prime Minister uh, had it in mind that there would be full scrutiny and debate. And uh, unfortunately, uh, aspects of this bill will not permit that full scrutiny or debate um, in terms of the time limits and deadlines which are um, scattered throughout the bill, uh, and also in terms of the uh, parliamentary procedures which are going to be adopted uh, in terms of looking at any regulations made under the bill, which are generally speaking of a negative uh, uh, legislative uh, element rather than an affirmative one. And can I bring in Professor Alison Young on, on those questions too, please? Thank you. Um, I think I have uh, nothing further to add on your second question. I agree that there is this possibility, but you have to read this against the backdrop of other provisions like uh, the UK Internal Market Act, which will uh, place uh, a limitation in practice of how extensively you would be able to um, <coughs> try and um, implement um, EU law going forward. Uh, with regards to your further question about the other alternative, I agree that the main alternative would be to take a sector-by-sector -sector approach. I think that has the advantage of preserving legal certainty. It also has the advantage of enhancing democratic scrutiny because there will be more time to go away and investigate and um, scrutinise through primary legislation, not just secondary legislation. So you actually involve legislators more effectively in scrutinising these new rules. I think it also has the advantage of enabling further consultation processes, enabling to, um, different um, legislators and governments to approach those who are influenced by these rules at the moment. So you can talk to them about, well, which rules do you want to stay, which rules should change going forward, and that will give a much better way of thinking about how far you want to mirror EU provisions or potentially change um, EU provisions going forward. The only other possible alternative I can think of as a kind of midway point would be to do something that would be a little bit more staggered, so to take your sector-by-sector -sector approach, but to set deadlines. And if you were going to have some kind of sunset provisions, to be much, much clearer about which provisions 
of EU law were going to be sunsetted in this way. One of the problems of this particular piece of legislation is, whilst it might be easy in some senses to identify retained EU law enacted under Section 2 of the European Communities Act 1972, because you'd be able to search that, it is much harder to necessarily be able to recognise every single piece of secondary legislation that was intended to implement an EU obligation, but which was enacted through another piece of parent legislation. So we already saw on Tuesday, for example, information about further pieces that have been identified. I think it was 1,400 pieces more than was on the EU dashboard. And that just points out how difficult it can be to spot everything. So the possible midway point would be to say, well, we've done a search. These are the ones we found. These are the ones that will be sunsetted and a certain time limit with then longer time periods to scrutinise. That's the only other possible midway I can think of. But obviously that would involve a lot of rolling pieces or rolling provisions to find and set deadlines, which I think is far more complicated than the alternative you propose, which I think is the much more preferable alternative in terms of democratic scrutiny and legal certainty. Thank you all. Uh, thank you, convener. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allen. Thank you, convener. Um, a question for any of you, really, but I'll begin with uh, Mr. Livingston. Um, uh, aside from all the democratic questions, which trouble many of us in this committee, about what's involved in this, this bill and the tabula rasa it seems to want to create. Um, I suppose a question I have, if any of you have any observations, but starting with Mr Livingston, it's about the sheer scale of what the UK government appears to be proposing here. Uh, I mean, it's difficult for us to get an idea of what kind of amount of civil service time might be involved in trying to, to recreate the laws that are sunsetted or, or whether, whether the Scottish Parliament chooses to go along with it or not. Um, Given they've just discovered another 1,400 laws that they've forgotten about, uh, I wonder if we could begin with Mr Livingston. I see Dr Hood not interested in answering that one as well, so perhaps uh, begin with you, Mr Livingston. Um, yeah, so I guess I can most usefully answer that from a practitioner's perspective um, in terms of advising clients uh, on, on what the law is. Um, the... Uh, you refer to it as a tabula rasa approach, but I guess I would refer to it as the um, where the where the onus is here, and the onus is on uh, proactive steps to be taken in order to preserve legislation, rather than proactive steps being taken to uh, repeal it or, uh, as Alison Young suggests, you know, identify particular pieces of legislation for sunsetting. Um, you know, su sunset clauses. Uh, greater use of sunset clauses may be a good idea in legislation. It would encourage um, more post-legislative scrutiny and uh, taking stock and deciding whether legislation still works is still required. But doing it this way is is very difficult because, as, as Alison Young said, you can't necessarily uh, know with absolute certainty what is within that category of things that is being repealed. Um, and I guess from, from a practitioner's perspective, just the one thing I would add to that is that um, the Scottish Government's uh, request of the UK Government is to exclude from the scope of the Sunset Clause um, legislation that is within devolved competence. Um, and as you say, leaving aside any sort of democratic issues from a practitioner's perspective, that would be an enormous headache um, to have to start with identifying whether something is within the category uh, of law that, uh, to which the Sunset provision applied. And then ask yourself the second question, whether it is in the subcategory of uh, things that are uh, within devolved competence, which is similarly not always an easy question. Um, you know, that would create uh, quite a lot of doubt from a legal certainty perspective as to whether a given piece of legislation was, was still in effect or not. Dr Hood, I don't know if you can answer the, um, I suppose the broader question is, why would any country volunteer to go down this legislative route? I think it's, um, I mean, this is November 2022, and obviously the, the kind of headline um, time is set for the end of 2023. And I, I would say, perhaps a very small point, but I would echo the Law Society's um, submission, written submission on this, that the end of 2023 is quite a vague term, and I, I found it perhaps a surprising term to use in legislation, which often a precision, a certain precision is involved. But leaving that more technical point aside, we are talking about just over a year now 
And given the amount of legislation on the dashboard and, as has already been noted, the amount of additional legislation which has recently been identified, it just has to be said, I think, that this is an absolutely massive piece of work um, to go through because of the nature of the sunset that things have to be, as, as uh, Mr Livingston has pointed out, one would have to take active steps to try and preserve. It's a massive piece of work to try and go through all of these pieces of legislation and identify what has to be preserved and then how that is to be done in terms of restating or replacing or whatever it might be. And there are a number of dangers with that. There are dangers in terms of whether the civil service and the various parliamentary committees and plenary sessions can cope with the amount of work involved as well as dealing with other work streams which are of importance. There's issues about whether legislation which was put in place to replace or restate is rushed, whether unintended consequences um, thereby result or uncertainty because things have had to be put in place very quickly um, without, again, as has been indicated, without stakeholder involvement, um, giving guidance on, on how things work, or there's just not enough time for sense checking and, and the testing that draftsmen and uh, civil servants would normally wish to do and that the parliament would normally wish to do. Um, and the other big risk, because it's a sunset, is that things would be overlooked and you end up with plainly put gaps in the law where something passes out um, and it isn't realised and then that causes uncertainty, cost and, and at worst actually could cause injustice uh, for people who are then affected by something which is dropped off the statute book that, that nobody appreciated in the rush to try and, and deal with such a massive project that no one realised it would drop away. Convener, I don't know if the others are willing to come in on any of those points. Um, yeah, thank you. So, I mean, I'll, I'll only reiterate what's already been said about, I suppose, the huge volume of, in terms of statutory instruments and in terms of retained direct EU law. But I also think there's a kind of a deeper point than just simply keeping track of all the various pieces of legislation. And you know, one of the points I made in my uh, written submission was that I don't think that section four of the dashboard, for instance, is particularly comprehensive in terms of the, the rights which, which might be lost. But there's also just a point that the bill in its sunsetting also sunsets a number of um, interpretative principles and also um, proposes to abolish not only general principles of EU law, but also the supremacy of EU law. And so when we're thinking about the task facing um, the civil service and you know, the devolved administrations, there's also this need to identify um, where domestic law, where law has been interpreted in a particular way, where there have been particular conflicts perhaps resolved in a certain way. So I think it goes beyond this mere Top, this mere task of identification, which we've already heard is incredibly difficult, to also potentially un unforeseen changes due to changes in interpretation, say, that may not have been preserved. And also the fact that there is now this power to, um, you know, to restate or to replace, which may lead to different restatements or differing replacements across all for nations of the UK in a way which it's quite hard to see, I suppose, how this will interact with what's already been agreed or proposed in terms of common frameworks and in terms of the Internal Market Act. So, yeah, I just think we need to think about how it goes beyond simply keeping track of all the different pieces of retained EU law. Uh, Professor Young? I think I'm back now. I think the other thing I would... Can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, I think the only other thing I would add is that um, each of the uh, departments, I presume, within Westminster, so each of the different um, ministerial departments will be trying to take stock of their particular area. And it won't necessarily always be clear which ministerial department has responsibility for which pieces of these delegated legislation that have been identified in the dashboard or that have been identified um, later on. 
So you've also got, not only have you got the problem of identifying, working out whether you're going to restate it, trying to find the time to go away and find them and decide what to do, you might end up with all sorts of possible clashes between departments, which means that things might fall through the gap because one department thinks it belongs to another department, or you might end up with potential trying departments having to negotiate which one is looking at different areas. So I think this is a huge task and it's going to be very, very difficult to do in a short period of time without extra resources and scrutiny. And the problem is that as because of the sunset clause, if you haven't discovered it and decided what to do with it to retain it, it will just disappear. And this is going to lead to huge problems for legal certainty. And can you, um, I don't know if uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Clancy, I beg your pardon, is, is willing to come in on that? Surely. Yes, indeed, I am. Um, I, I agree with uh, all the comments that have been made so far uh, by the other people on the panel. Um, it, can I offer just a couple of observations? Um, I think the the, uh, the blanket nature of the sunset provision in Clause 1 is, uh, is unjustified uh, in the way in which I have seen sunset provisions be pretty specific in other pieces of legislation. Um, uh, but this uh, does not uh, identify the legislation uh, other than in uh, the, the sort of limited way of stating uh, that it's uh, all the uh, EU-derived subordinate legislation and retained direct EU legislation uh, to be revoked uh, at the end of 2023. Of course, what one would ideally want to see is a, a, a schedule with a list uh, of uh, these uh, items of legislation uh, so that uh, people would exactly know uh, what was going to be revoked. Um, uh, and uh, there is no such list. And uh, I'm sorry to say the dashboard um, uh, promises a lot, but delivers not exactly what one would have hoped for, um, uh, apart from the, uh, the rather um, uh, confusing way in which the dashboard describes that it applies to uh, law uh, pr prepared and, and implemented by uh, the UK Parliament um, uh, and the UK Government. Um, it, it does also say that, uh, oh, and by the way, there might be some uh, devolved matters in there too, and, uh, just out of interest. I took a look at the Ministry of Justice section, uh, and sure enough, there are uh, pieces of legislation which uh, are uh, from the, uh, uh, from from Scottish uh, origin, um, uh, in terms of the uh, the continuity of the uh, the Rome Conventions on on uh, contract and non contractual obligations, uh, but you would have to know what you're looking for in order to find that, and I think that that's one of the the difficulties which one is confronted with is uh, that identification issue. Um, and that's going to be a big job. If if it's 2,400 uh, on the dashboard at the moment, uh, and then a further 1,400 uh, to be added, um, and then uh, the uh, uh, the subordinate legislation or the EU exit legislation end law, uh, which applies uh, from the devolved uh, uh, legislatures, uh, then that will mount up to being um, well. Certainly, approaching 5,000 pieces of legislation, uh, probably, uh, maybe, maybe slightly less, but maybe slightly more. And um, indeed, I, I'm not sure that anyone has done an accurate count. Uh, then uh, there is the way in which the extension of the sunset can only be done by ministers of the crown, and uh, that the devolved uh, administrations do not have that power. Uh, so. Um, uh, that creates additional uncertainty uh, because, uh, of course, we are not sure that the Minister of the Crown uh, would, would uh, have the same sensitivities uh, to uh, devolved retained EU law, uh, to put it uh, in that phrase, um, uh, as uh, they would have to all the other pieces of legislation which Whitehall departments uh, will be dealing with. I did. Uh, short analysis, and with the help of, of uh, uh, um, clerks from the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, um, identified that there were 83 pieces of subordinate legislation uh, um, dealt with under the protocol between the Scottish Government and the Parliament. 
but I think there are a further 86 pieces of uh, EU exit legislation which may or may not all be retained EU law, um, uh, which were passed by the Parliament, which relate only to devolved matters um, uh, and were not requests to the UK uh, to include a devolved provision uh, in a UK instrument. So I think that uh, that clearly indicates that there are these these elements, um, and that you know, rough rule of thumb, it takes us to uh, 170 odd um, uh, pieces of, of uh, uh, subordinate legislation. But that's clearly not necessarily a good way to do things, especially knowing my arithmetical skills not being uh, the best. Thank you. Uh, if there's time convener, my other question, um, I'll direct it to Mr Livingston, since he, you referred to some of these themes, I think. Um, the Hansard Society has indicated that the, the proposed legislation would, in their words, be an uh, abdication of uh, many of the UK Parliament's roles. Uh, I don't know what the word is you would use if they are choosing to remove some of the role of this Parliament. Presumably it's deposing that role rather than abdicating it. I'm not sure how it works. But... They've said that it has potentially serious implications, to use these words, for, for devolution. And I just wonder, can you give an indication of what the, what the implications are for Scots law and the way Scots law develops um, if, it's, if it's developed increasingly by ministers who, to use Mr Clancy's words, may have a limited sensitivity to, to what Scots law, Scots law making is? So, I mean, I think this goes back to the uh, the point about whether it's necessary for ministers of the Crown to have the powers to restate, amend, etc., in relation to devolved um, matters. Um, and I'm, I'm not sure I can really improve on my previous answer, which is I don't see the need for it. Um, I don't get the impression that the powers are being conferred in anticipation of them actually being used by ministers of the Crown in devolved matters, which only reinforces my um, uncertainty about why, why they have that scope to begin with. Um, so I, I, think, I think what we can talk about at the moment is the in-principle point, and I think we've, we've spoken about that. In terms of the in-practice point, we'd really be speculating about uh, whether whether those powers will actually be used. Um, I mean, I would be very interested to know why uh, the the bill is written in the way that it's written and the powers are conferred in the way they're conferred. Um, without knowing that, I'm, I'm not sure. I should. Others may feel better placed to speculate than me. Thank you. Unless anyone else wants to come in. Difficult to tell. I don't know. Well, I would just add briefly to that that um, you're quite right to identify the fact obviously Scotland has a different legal system and therefore there are different there are a, a number of different aspects there are aspects in terms of the the direction for example that this parliament wants to take but there are also technical issues about Scots law continuing to, to work as it were and the way in which if certain uh, regulations or, or laws are passed at Westminster, how important it would be to ensure that there is sufficient technical input to make sure that that would work in, in the different context of the, the Scottish legal system. Um, but I think other than that, the only point is really one I think was already covered, which is a broader point that, as you say, the Hansard Society have raised concerns about a lack of scrutiny um, in the way that legislation could be passed at Westminster. And obviously, if those, and, and we don't know, but if those powers were used in the devolved space, as it were, then obviously that would have a, a concern then for this parliament, because obviously if there is a concern about scrutiny in the way that the laws are being passed, then obviously that's a concern for this parliament as to whether there has been sufficient input or scrutiny. Can I, I just come back in briefly? Um, sorry, I, I just realised that... Um, we shouldn't be unfair to the Office of the Advocate General here. Um, so, uh, you know, when the, the UK, UK Parliament and UK Government does frequently uh, make legislation that uh, that applies in Scotland and needs to interact with Scots law, and, and obviously the Office of the Advocate General is, is there um, to ensure that it does work for Scots law. So, 
So in, ter in terms of, as a technical matter, I mean, the, the ability is there uh, to make sure that legislation does fit with Scots law. It's not a Minister of the Crown just sort of freelancing uh, and assuming that Scots law is the same as in, Eng as in England and Wales. Um, but yet yeah, th that, that is not responsive to the sort of accountability and scrutiny points. Um, but just purely as a technical matter, I was probably a little bit unfair uh, to, to UK government's Scots law capabilities previously. I think Mr Clancy wants to come in as well. Mr Clancy, I'm not sure we can hear you. There we are. My microphone has been unmuted. That's great. Thank you, um, uh, convener. Um, the, uh, I, I think we, setting it within the context of, of what we have in terms of uh, um, its scrutiny, both at Westminster uh, and in the Scottish Parliament, uh, in the bill there is the limited uh, period of time uh, which is now uh, fast approaching uh, only a, a year uh, until uh, the, uh, the, the, um, uh, the uh, revoking takes place. Uh, and I think that um, it's certainly from the point of view of uh, the Scottish Government, uh, which has already announced its programme for government with uh, numerous bills already on their way through the Parliament and more to come uh, in the course of next year. Um, it, it will be challenging uh, to deal with a, a significant amount of additional work which has not been factored in uh, at this point uh, in time. Uh, and it will also be challenging in Westminster where there are a number of significant programme bills uh, already going through which were announced in the Queen's speech uh, and uh, which um, uh, the including this bill, um, uh, and which will then be making their way through um, uh, on the, the basis of, of hitting the, the end of 2023. Thank you, uh, uh, Kirsty Hood, for uh, um, a comment from our, our paper, um, uh, but also the extension period uh, to uh, the 17th of June 2026. Again, in our paper, uh, we make the point that that, uh, that is not necessarily the most rational way to approach legislation is to uh, simply pick a date, which is the 10th anniversary of the EU referendum, uh, and say we will do all this work within that period of time, or we will defer lawmaking or, or make new law within that period of time. Uh, that's, that's not a, a rational approach because it does not take account of consultation um, uh, and all the other things that need to be done uh, with a piece of legislation um, uh, to make sure that it works, make sure that it's clear, to make sure that it's uh, effective and coherent. Uh, and of course, that's the point um, uh, when when legislators like yourselves uh, and uh, and those uh, counterparts in in uh, Westminster uh, address a piece of legislation, they are looking to make sure that law works for the people, um, uh, works for individuals and businesses, uh, and uh, there will be very little opportunity to consult properly, uh, and that individuals and businesses uh, will find themselves perhaps in the dark uh, at any one of these deadlines, which uh, I hope um, the amendments which uh, we are currently preparing at the Law Society will be taken up. Um, uh, when the bill uh, passes through the UK Parliament, um, uh, and uh, those those deadlines will be extended, uh, perhaps uh, five or ten years hence, uh, to make sure that this particular job is done in a proper way, uh, rather than in in the rush against these deadlines, which uh, are not particularly uh, structured, taking into account all that needs to be done to make a piece of legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Mr Ruskell. Thanks. Um, I was interested in how the um, status of retained EU case law might change uh, as a result of, of this bill. And I, I was quite struck by the points that were made in a number of the submissions, including Faculty of Advocates, about the, um, how retained case law, the state of this, status of it may be, may be you know, diminished in some way if it was judged that, that that case law may restrict the proper development of domestic law. I, I, I don't have in my mind what, what a proper development of domestic law would, would actually be in the, 
in the, in the mind of ministers. So I, I wondered if you could expand on that and if there are any particular examples uh, that, that you could use to sort of colour colour that scenario, that would be that would be useful. So if I could start with, with Dr Hood, that would be great, and then move on to others. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I mean, this is... Uh, there is the, the broader point that um, in terms of... It would make a, a change to the way in which interpretation was handled. And I think... And this comes back to a point that Dr Hancock has made, that in terms of... EU law, when the courts consider um, how pieces of legislation work, and bear in mind here that we are now thinking historically, when the, the UK left the EU, that, that broke uh, the dynamic alignment. And so what you were there for, to a great extent, looking at here is courts being asked to interpret what the law was at some point in the past, prior to withdrawal, and yet some of the key tools being taken, potentially taken away from the court. Whereas at the time when the parties regulated their behaviour, when they sought legal advice, um, they would have taken those key tools into consideration as to what certain terms meant. And given that, for example, particular terms in EU legislation will have had certain meanings and that will have been set down by uh, courts at the time, it is difficult um, to ask courts to, to go back and to interpret and apply what the law was at a given time without using the tools that they would have expected to use at, at that time. And in particular, yes, I mean, the on that, that point of detail where the bill says you know, that certain things would have to be taken into account if a court is deciding whether to depart from the retained EU case law and that particular phrase that one of the factors is the extent to which the retained EU case law restricts the proper development of domestic law now that it seems to me is potentially a very difficult factor because what is meant by the proper development I mean it's it's a, an unusual. It's an unusual phrase to ask a court to try and work out what the proper development of law is. I mean, the the courts are there to to apply the law. They're there to interpret the law and apply it to the actings and behaviours of parties. And of course, to some extent. Um, that may, as the court does that, that might develop the law as a, as, a, as a body of law in the sense that it sheds light on perhaps something which was unclear that someone's particular case allows the court to shed light on how the law is properly understood and properly interpreted. But to, to ask the court to work out how domestic law should properly develop and whether something is, is restricting it it is, I think, um, perhaps a, a phrase or a, or a device that would not be one that the courts would have a lot of experience or familiarity with. And I, I don't know whether the thinking behind it is the idea that in some way a, a piece of EU legislation um, and therefore particular case law which interpreted what was EU legislation, that in some way that is, was appropriate to a period of EU membership, but it was not appropriate out with that context. And say that may be the thinking of it, but I think that the terminology of that is one which I think could potentially pose difficulties for the, for the courts to, to do that, given that they are there, the making of laws for, for this parliament and for the other parliaments within the UK um, I say that the, the courts are there just simply to interpret, to apply, to shed light and to allow the body of law to develop in the important work that they do. I mean, does it effectively invite courts to kind of second guess the, the direction of policy and the direction of political decisions around, say, environmental legislation? Uh, go back to the Habitats Directive, there's obviously a vast amount of case law that's come on the back of that consideration of you know public interest test and other and other aspects would they does it require courts then to sort of look at 
what might be coming on the statute books and where things are going. I think, or, well, I mean, that... Or is the temptation always going to be to look back at mm -hmm. the 50 years mm -hmm. of progress and say, well, yeah. that, that, that's part of the proper development? And I think that is the difficulty, is as written, does it extend that invitation to the courts? And obviously, for parties then appearing before the courts, um, what arguments would, would be put before it? Because, yes, as it is phrased, it, it does seem to me that it could have both of those invitations, whether simply a backward look or whether a forward look as well, because the idea of this proper development, um, I mean, proper development in, it, in itself um, it could perhaps be said to be a, a, a loaded term, and that comes back to your point, is it asking courts to, to second-guess direction or, or trajectory? But, but what if a party says to the court, well, that may be the trajectory, but I don't think that's the proper direction that, that the law should take. So... It, it, indeed, it, it does strike me that it potentially opens up these kind of invitations um, and then puts the court in a, in a position of, of trying to give effect to that, which it's asked to give effect to that factor, but to try and balance the court's normal role within our, our society and within our system with the way that that is put. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I suppose there's a wider context here with, for example, levelling up bill, mm -hmm. potential removal of environmental assessment procedures and, and that sort of side of things as a shift in, in policy. Um, Dr Hancock, did Thank you want to... Uh, on, on that, the, your first question, Mark? Yeah, I was just going to move to Dr Hancock just mm -hmm. to see if, if she wanted to come in oh, okay. on, on that, particularly for moving to others. Oh, yeah, <coughs> no, um, well, um, thank you. Um, yeah, so I suppose one of the things that the bill does um, is, is to essentially, I think it's trying to make it easier for domestic courts to depart, or it's trying to suggest that domestic courts do depart. And one of the points that the um, government raises in its explanatory notes to the bill is that it's building upon um, some of the factors that were mentioned in this, this case of, of tune in against Warner. Um, but so, but in that case, a considerable emphasis was given to legal certainty and to the fact that a court wouldn't depart lightly, I suppose, from retained EU case law, given the, given the risks to legal certainty. And this point that's made, or one of the factors which courts are supposed to take into account, the fact that decisions of foreign courts might are otherwise not binding, this was raised in Tunum, but it was in relation to the fact that comparative law was, or comparative arguments were made to the court, where there were very se separate legislative regimes, different case law, whereas it's not that the European Court of Justice was not treated as a foreign court, but it was a foreign court interpreting a very similar body of law and which had considerable expertise, also that it was interpreting standards that were enmeshed in international standards beyond the EU framework. In terms of the extent, or in terms of this um, point about the extent to which retained EU law may be impacting upon the proper development of UK law, um, in tune and again, policy arguments were made kind of relating to, to this point, and, and the court refused to depart from retained EU case law. And I think when this power has been used in the past, it's been when there's been considerable injustice potentially caused through um, long-standing case law. Whereas when we're talking about the interpretation of retained EU law, we're, we're talking about a lot of uh, the interpretation, I suppose, of considerable legislation. Um, so it's, it's hard to see that... Um, this power will be used that frequently by domestic courts, um, although I suppose they will have to take very seriously the fact that these criteria will be listed. Mm -hmm. okay. um, Professor Young? Thank you. Um, I think I would reiterate uh, the points that have already been made, and I agree that the concern is the use of proper seems to push this too far towards policy arguments. And that's particularly when you put it in the context of the uh, provisions that come early in that particular section. So you're looking at beforehand at elements of how it might have been uh, determined, um, the circumstances might have changed, or the fact that when they're in Europe means that there'll be differences of how we want to interpret provisions. And so it's very odd to see this uh, proper development of domestic law. And I've been trying to understand what it might be other than 
an element of a policy choice of where you think the law might uh, be required to develop. And the only thing I can think of is this idea that when you were looking at retained EU case law, so case law interpreting provisions of EU law, then obviously the Court of Justice of the European Union does have the context of we need to have harmonisation, we need a uniform provision across the European Union. And obviously, once you are no longer in that particular scenario, you do not necessarily have to have uniformity. But I do not understand how you can delineate clearly when the Court of Justice would have chosen a provision because it wants uniformity and when it's because they think this is the best way of interpreting that piece of legislation and then once they do that they achieve uniformity. So um and it's also very difficult um not not just in practice but it's also sort of problematic to then be able to say that we just because we don't have to have uniformity this means that it would not be a proper development if we were to go away and retain this. There can be other good reasons for continuing to interpret the provision because of legal certainty and because this is a good interpretation. And the only way I can try and think of giving you examples is if you look at provisions like uh, the working time regulations, which implement the working time directive, you have to determine what would be classed as work in certain scenarios. And so you might be thinking about, well, if you have, um, for example, um, workers who are on call, does this count as work because they're on call, or does this not count as work because they could be somewhere else waiting for the call to come in to so count as their working hours? And I'm just not sure how you could then look at that and say, when I look at a previous interpretation of an individual being on call as being within their work, working hours, whether I change that because I think it's not proper development because we want to develop it in a different way. I can't see it as anything other than a policy choice of deciding I don't want this person to be counted as working hours or counted as working hours. I, it's very hard for me to then sort of delineate that as anything other than a policy choice when it comes to proper development. Mm -hmm. And this gets even more concerning because it's not just the parties that can raise this and say, we think this would restrict the proper development, so we want to change the interpretation. The law officers can intervene and make a reference up if they think a decision was taken incorrectly, which again will open up invitations to the court to, to uh, potentially make policy choices. So I'm very suspicious of this idea of a proper development in its context. I, I don't understand what it can mean other than policy choices. Yeah, that's a useful example, the working time directive, perhaps something that we've all taken for granted. Um, uh, can I ask Mr Clancy or Mr Livingston if they, if they want to come in on this as well? Or... Charles? Mr Clancy? It, yeah, surely, by all means. Um, as I just find the section in the bill, uh, the clause in the bill, uh, uh, I endorse what's been said already, um, uh, and I think that um, uh, there is a uh, uh, a significant issue about the way in which we are going to be proceeding to deal with uh, retained EU case law uh, in, in the future, and, and uh, this provision highlights that um, by um, essentially um, uh, taking away some discretion from the court. Um, you will notice there in, uh, sub, uh, in clause 7.3, uh, uh, which inserts new, section, uh, new subsection 5, um, that the higher court concerned must have regard to, uh, not may have regard to, but must have regard to, so that an obligation is being placed on the court uh, to have regard to these other factors. And those factors being the fact that decisions of a foreign court are not binding. Um, now, is that a fact or is it a, a, an opinion of law? It's certainly the case that the decisions of foreign courts um, uh, are not binding. Um, uh, if, 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 unless there are special arrangements made, um, it, because um, it, it's it understood that such decisions of such courts uh, are persuasive, uh, and the comparative law arguments which one would put forward uh, to make that so would be that, that uh, uh, you would not be proposing to the court that they are bound in any way by the decision of a court outside the United Kingdom or a court outside even the jurisdiction of Scotland, uh, but that the decision there would be persuasive, perhaps, if it was dealing with the same point uh, and the same interpretation of the same uh, um, provision of the law. 
but the court is now going to have to um, uh, take into or have regard to this uh, this uh, factor. Uh, then um, changes of circumstances which are relevant to the retained EU case law. Well, they would, wouldn't they? Anyway, uh, have have regard to such changes of circumstances. Um, the uh, any court would be listening to the uh, representatives presenting the case in front of of it, uh, and would then uh, also be aware of changes in circumstances, um, one of which may be withdrawal from the European Union. Uh, and then lastly, um, uh, the discussion around uh, the uh, uh, importance of the word proper uh, in the development of domestic law. Well, from whose standpoint is proper to be interpreted? Uh, if it is uh, from the point of view of the court, um, there may, need, may be no proper development of domestic law at all. It, it implies that there is some policy objective uh, uh, which uh, needs to be attained, and I suspect that the proper uh, element here is uh, uh, inserted in the bill because uh, the ministers involved have an objective about uh, the uh, interpretation of the law that probably relates to um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, the underlying philosophy of the bill, which is to make sure that European uh, uh, retained law, European Union retained law, uh, is not going to apply in the future, uh, and that uh, we will have uh, so-called, in inverted commas, domestic, closing inverted commas, law, uh, which would apply <coughs> instead. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, Mr Livingston? Just very briefly, I don't really dissent from anything that's been said, but just observe from a um, practitioner's perspective, one shouldn't underestimate the small c conservatism of the courts. Um, and and I'm, I think I'm, I'm not sure that uh, this provision will result in many, if any, cases coming out differently than they would have in any event. When when you're dealing with something as vague as the proper development of domestic law, I think I think the courts will often take the view that it's it's vague enough that they don't really need to do anything with it because they can't clearly be uh, accused of failing to take account of it. Um, so, you know, it, it's not a, exactly a defence of legislation to say that I don't think it's uh, I don't think it's likely to have much of an effect, so you don't need to worry about it. Um, but uh, I think as a matter of practice, it's unlikely to be decisive in in very many cases. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um a little conscious of time, if we could, could be succinct in, in answers going forward. Uh, unfortunately, we've got a couple of agenda items still to cover before having to leave to chamber. So um, I'm going to bring in Miss Boyack next. Thanks very much, convener. Um, very much appreciate all the written evidence you've supplied in advance. Um, it does feel um, unprecedented, actually, because you're all very measured witnesses. Um, and the background you've all got um, a, gives weight to the, the comments you've given, which are worrying about legal certainty, risks, unattended consequences, lack of scrutiny, government capacity or lack of capacity. Um, can I go to Michael Clancy first? Because in your um, submission, right at the start, in your general comments, you said there's no reason why retained EU law cannot be considered a sustainable concept. On the other hand, it would be equally possible, following a thorough review and relevant amendments, that incorporation to domestic law in the four UK jurisdictions could be completed. Do you want to say a little bit more on that? Because thus far it's been this will be a disaster. Uh, there's something about what would be a more positive approach that would enable a degree of scrutiny and uh, accountability for not just parliamentarians, but people we represent. Could you kick off with that, Mr Clancy? Uh, I'll try my best. Um, uh, thank you very much indeed for um, uh, the compliments which you paid to the, the briefing, uh, Ms Boyer. Thank you indeed. Uh, the, uh, it is what it is. Uh, what, what we said there, um, uh, uh, the, the concept of retained EU law um, it was the only place to go uh, once uh, the referendum had decided that uh, the UK was leaving the European Union. Um, uh, uh, unless one wanted uh, a, a, a fee for all uh, where there would be no certainty in the law uh, and uh, no clarity. 
Um, uh, so retained EU law as a concept um, it had to be the, the one which was adopted. And I think in previous evidence, I have uh, highlighted that, that um, uh, when, uh, uh, when similar sorts of seismic changes have happened constitutionally, um, uh, let us say, in, in colonial uh, experience and, and uh, uh, colonies becoming independent, um, uh, there is frequently a provision in that independence legislation which says that uh, the existing law, as at a particular date, um, normally English law, um, in our experience, uh, wa was continued uh, after independence until such time as it is changed by the newly independent uh, legislature. Uh, so I think that, that, that's, that following that kind of model uh, was quite correct, um, uh, because it ensured that there was certainty about what the law was, uh, and uh, because um, uh, uh, underlying principles such as the supremacy of EU law were maintained, um, uh, then uh, there was guidance as to uh, how this would be interpreted, uh, and other principles such as proportionality and equal treatment uh, were also uh, being being kept. Uh, so uh, these provisions uh, make sure made sure uh, that uh, there was um, a relatively good understanding of what the law would be after we left the European Union. Um, to do it any other way would pr produce the opposite result. It would uh, lack clarity, lack certainty, uh, and have an adverse impact uh, on individuals and businesses. And, uh, and I think that, uh, as other um, uh, colleagues on the panel have, have stated uh, throughout this morning's evidence, uh, this kind of, of uh, the kind of changes which we're seeing in the bill are reintroducing elements of lack of certainty and lack of clarity, uh, and uh, the potential for adverse impact uh, on on uh, businesses and individuals in Scotland and in the wider UK. Thank you very much. Um, could I go to um, uh, Kirsty Hood, Doctor Hood, um, about that issue? I mean, uh, it is six years on since the vote. And suddenly, in a year, all of this legislation is to be wrapped up, and it's going to be incredibly hard for us to scrutinise it. What would your advice be to the Scottish Parliament in terms of how we make sure that we don't miss out on really vital legislation that's going to change people's lives here? I think you're absolutely right to identify that key issue about changing people's lives, because, of course, that is the, the, that is the important thing to remember, is that legislation isn't a symbol um, and the intern legislation is there to facilitate and intervene in the lives and work of people and businesses across the country. It's, it's there to, to serve a purpose and to allow things to work. And as far as individuals, as far as businesses are concerned, they don't really probably have much of an interest other than the interest that any of us might have in how historically pieces of you know rulemaking came to be. What they are interested in knowing when it comes to actually arranging their affairs is what is the law. And the thing here is that, as has been indicated, the 2018 Act took the what would seem to be the the normal stance that would happen when there are, are uh, significant times of constitutional change, which is to keep the body of law in place, to allow continuity and certainty in the way that people go about their, their daily lives and their business. And that can then chain, be changed going forward in the appropriate way with consultation, with scrutiny uh, and so on. So that system is already in place. And to try and bring everything forward in this in this way um, and put essentially put a very, very tight deadline on a massive piece of work and do it in such a way that if something is overlooked or missed, then that has very real consequences for people. It, it does involve um, a great deal of work for civil servants and parliamentarians, uh, and it does bring with it risk, it, it does seem to, to me, and I, I know to other bodies and, and commentators that have uh, that have commented whether here or in terms of the Westminster uh, evidence giving context. Too. 
question maybe with Mr Livingston, because you, you talked about risk, uncertainty. Um, what kind of risk assessment should we be doing as parliamentarians to try and identify elements of legislation that might be most vulnerable in this process? Um, so in terms of what the Scottish Parliament should be doing in terms of scrutiny and accountability, I think that would follow on from the question of what the Scottish Government would do in the event that the bill is passed. Mm -hmm. um, because, as, as I think I mentioned, you know, the, the powers in the bill could be used by the Scottish Government simply to save everything that would otherwise be sunsetted, um, more or less, certainly in terms of the secondary legislation, um, in which case there isn't so much for the Scottish Parliament to scrutinise. Um, as, as I said before, from a, from a certainty and a risk perspective, ideally things would be saved by reference to a list of here are the items of legislation that are being saved. But if necessary, I think they could be saved by reference to legislation as a category. So everything that is that, that would be within devolved competence, um, essentially everything over which the bill confers powers on the Scottish ministers. Um, so in terms of parliamentary scrutiny, I think I think that's the preliminary question. Uh, how much would there be to scrutinise? Um, I think the UK Parliament will have a much more difficult time because clearly the UK government's intention is not to save everything. But if, if the Scottish government wants to essentially uh, act as if the bill had never happened, then the powers are available not to do that in its entirety, but certainly to take away much of the, the workload that it would cause. OK, thank you. And uh, Dr Hancock, you gave us a... Um, really interesting set of um, thoughts about this in terms of what we should be thinking about. Um, do you have any comments on this in terms of what we should be doing? Should this legislation go through as is? Um, I suppose one point I would make is just that that there appear to be there to me there are kind of I suppose well many issues, but I suppose there's one there's one point about just the sunsetting. And, the, and then there's also the point about the kind of saving, I suppose, or, or the um, powers to restate. And, and I know that one of the concerns or the policy concerns behind the bill is that there are currently not the... Um, the government feels that there aren't adequate powers to amend retained EU law. And that this goes back to the earlier question about interactions between the, the Continuity Act and this new bill. So, I mean, I feel that the... In my opinion, the, the use of the sunset clause adds further complications potentially onto the fact that there are then these quite wide powers to amend retained EU law. And I do wonder if there would be a way around sunsetting either by you know, listing all the provisions or by some form of downgrading or of the status of retained EU law without necessarily this cliff edge that we again find ourselves in. And I think it's also one point uh, which I think has already been raised about this bill is that it's not just about, even if we do talk about the powers to kind of save EU law as it is, there is a deregulatory element to this bill, um, as Dr Hood has mentioned, in terms of this regulatory burden, which can include things such as, you know, will the cost be increased? And so all these kind of various concerns, I think, make it quite an unsatisfactory way of trying to ensure legal certainty and high standards and prevent, um, you know, as has been said, injustices and changes in the law that aren't intended. OK, thank you. And Professor Young, do you have any comments to wrap up on this in terms of what we should be doing to attempt to mitigate the impact of this potentially very damaging legislation? Yeah, only very briefly that it's, it's a case of also having to keep track of decisions to decide to restate or decide not to bother to restate, and so therefore it collapses. So it's not just the element of scrutinising any pieces of legislation that come through, but thinking of ways of scrutinising those decisions to either restate or not. Thank you very much. That's helpful. Thank you. And um, if you could... I Again, just emphasising time, but our final question from Ms Minto. Thank you, Convener, and thank you, panel, and thank you for um, all the um, documents and information you've provided with us. Um, I'd just like to question a bit more about the practical um, impact um, this is going to have on um, the, the normal person walking in the street. Um, I note as well what Dr Hancock said about um, the deregularity um, agenda and how that 
may impact on the way we live our lives. And then there was also a comment um, in the Law Society, um, Mr Clancy, um, about the definition of burden and how that may impact on a, a race to the bottom, which I think was raised in the Chamber of Westminster as well. So a few things, really the practical impacts, the examples. I thought um, Professor Young's example of the Working Time Directive was a very strong one. I just wonder if there's other ones that we can actually focus into practicalities of the impact of this proposed this bill. I don't know who wants to take that first. Dr. Hancock. I mean, to me, a really clear example is Article 157 of the TFEU, which is the right to equal pay for equal work and work of equal value between men and women. And this is only saved. This isn't fully um, replicated, I suppose, in the current Equality Act. And there's been you know, quite recent case law. So there's a big case involving um, Tesco's, I suppose, in which Article 157 is still very much used um, by by litigants and by applicants um, and so uh, and because as well it's able to be relied upon against um, employers and so I think this is just one area in which this is something which um, if not saved will be fully sunsetted but will also have to be saved in terms of it's all the case law of the Court of Justice will need to somehow be replicated mm -hmm. in terms of how it's um, restated or, or replaced in some ways so that's just one example I'll give. Thank you. Dr Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I mean, I think the, the thing about the thing about the EU legislation and, and taking that in its widest sense, as Dr Hancock said, in terms of the, the temperature of context and, and so on, it's important to realise that the impact of the EU over the, the whole period of our membership, it is woven into so many pieces of our law. And these can be things which appear to be big statements of principle, but also things of really quite intense technical detail. And we're talking across, it is difficult probably to imagine a sector or area of the law where there, there hasn't been an impact of some kind. And therefore, in terms of, although it may not perhaps always be obvious to people within their daily lives or within their daily business, um, there are so many areas where where um, it is affected and therefore change within these various sectors therefore does have the impact to, uh, does have the, the potential to impact on people really across the board. And in terms of the deregulatory, yes, I think it's, it's perhaps difficult to add too much to what the Hansard Society have said in, in terms of the way in which burden, mm -hmm. um, and what's been said already here this morning, the way that burden is defined does have the potential to mean that protections enjoyed by businesses and by individuals um, could be downgraded, but there would be difficulties, uh, conversely, in enhancing um, protection, and, and that would obviously mm -hmm. be something businesses and individuals would be... Um, mm -hmm. So I think, I think I read of. somewhere that um, um, testing of cosmetics on animals is, is brought into this, all the, the EU legislation as well, so that, that may um, have, a ne have a negative impact if that's lost. Um, um, Mr Livingston, have you got...? Um, so, I, I find it slightly difficult to talk about concrete examples, um, which is not to dodge the question, but it's more to illustrate a key point about the bill, which is that we don't actually know what would go and what would be saved. Um, but the, because the, the starting premise is that something goes unless it's saved, at that point you're then speculating. Um, which goes to that sort of scrutiny and, and accountability element in that because it's being done this way, one can really only talk in hypotheticals and when it comes to the point of decision about what goes and what's saved, there's limited ability to discuss it there. So, you know, you could talk forever about what might be included, but until you know what, what the, how the bill is to be used, you can't really have the proper discussion, which kind of illustrates one of the difficulties with the bill. Thank you for that. Um, I'm just thinking of known unknowns, unknown unknowns, etc., etc. Um, Mr. Clancy. It is the unknown elements, and of course, looking at, at the provisions in respect of sunset, it, it, we know that a Minister of the Crown can extend the sunset under Section 1. Uh, but Scottish ministers, Welsh ministers, and Northern Ireland uh, executive cannot. Um, and uh, 
they can't make any extension there, so that uh, we we don't know what might be extended um, it, it, by a minister of the crown. Um, and I take the point which uh, Charles Livingston made about the excellent work which the Office of the Advocate General uh, does in uh, making sure that um, uh, ministers of the crown are aware of the Scottish implications um, in the legislation which we deal with. But under section or clause three of the bill. Um, the sunset uh, for retained EU rights um, uh, powers and liabilities is uh, is subject to no particular extension provisions at all, um, and indeed uh, they are repealed at the end of 2023. So there is a, a group of rights and powers in there which uh, are not enumerated in any kind of a way, um, uh, other than by reference back to section four of the. European Union Withdrawal Act, um, and it, so therefore um, that is likely to have some impact on individuals, as well as the general listing uh, of uh, uh, EU-derived subordinate legislation and retained direct EU legislation. Um, I, like Charles, I, I don't have a list. Um, I suppose that there ought to be a list, but um, uh, that uh, there's no sign that that's happening. On the burdens point. Um, uh, the point that we were making in relation to the definition of burden uh, is that the provisions in uh, clause 15 um, uh, relating to burdens um, uh, are different uh, from those in the Legislative and Regulatory Reform Act of 2006, and that there needs to be some kind of um, a determinative consistency, uh, particularly as there doesn't seem to be any kind of uh, cross uh, amendment of, of uh, the existing legislation. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, very briefly, Mr. Golden, and please, if you can be succinct in answers, it would be very helpful. Thanks. It was just to briefly explore some comments from Dr. Hood and Professor Young around the Internal Market Act. And if we start with Professor Young, I'm just interested, given that it's Scottish government policy to align with newly introduced EU law although it hasn't been enacted yet, we could see a situation whereby there's a possibility for divergence between certain parts of the UK. And if that happens, that divergence is at odds with the principles of the Internal Market Act. How would you see this play out and what could be done by the UK and Scottish governments and other devolved administrations to preempt this and or resolve any issues that may arise? Um, thank you. I'll try and be brief. I think my concern would be in particular with regard to um, EU measures that deal with uh, product safety requirements. So anything that does with things like safety of supply, so things like gas supply or safety of components that can go into goods. And obviously, if they lapse, um, although there is the ability in Scotland to then go away and enact measures to retain these, they can then start triggering the fact that although they can be retained in Scotland, the effect through the Internal Market Bill would be if they're not being retained in other parts of the UK, then those goods that aren't as safe or lawful and should also be able to be sold in Scotland. So it can undermine the effect of wanting to track in those ways, which I think could be very problematic. In terms of what you can do, I think it's a case of trying your best to liaise across the different uh, devolved governments and to think about how much further you can push on the common frameworks to make sure there is commonality going forward to protect those particular measures. And maybe there can be mechanisms between um, the devolved governments and legislature, as well as with regard to Westminster, about which of these provisions you would like to use your powers to retain in order to try and get some form of commonality across the UK. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Hood. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, I, mean, I think the, all I would really add to that is that the, one of the points I think which was flagged at the time when the Internal Market Act was going through and when it was uh, in the bill stage is that on the face of it, it appeared to allow less divergence for Scotland within the UK than divergence had been possible when the, the UK was an EU member state and we, we had a, a broader grouping. And that obviously raises an issue for this parliament and for the other devolved legislatures about how far policy choices voted on by elected members within the legislatures can be given effect to and how far the Internal Market Act cuts across those policy choices, starting from the 
the proposition that where you have different devolved legislatures, there must be within the system a respect for the different legislatures within their different uh, competent areas to give effect to the, the policy choices that they are that they as elected members vote upon. Thanks for that. Can Charles I just, Livingston. Yeah, can I, can I just come in very briefly on a technical point? So I think the grandfathering provision within the Internal Market Act will be key in terms of its relationship with the, um, with the current bill. Um, anything that, that was in existence prior to the Internal Market Act is, is unaffected by the Internal Market Act. I think if, if provisions are uh, prevented from sunsetting, if they're saved under the bill, I think the grandfathering would unquestionably still apply to them. If they are only restated, I think it probably still applies to them. Um, if they are modified, then you get into more difficult territory. Um, so I think that grandfathering provision is, is a key thing to keep in mind when discussing that issue. Thanks, that's very interesting. Uh, don't think anyone else wants to come in, convener. I think we'll have to draw it to a close there. Um, can I thank all our witnesses for their attendance and indeed for the briefings um, prior to this session. But I'm going to now move into private session. Thank you.